What's up, everybody? Oh, yeah. This is the live version of the Curl Your Video Business Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Coral. Welcome. So glad you're here. This is uh, this is something a little bit different. I decided to uh, to hop on live. We've got a whole bunch of topics that I could talk about. Uh, I don't have a guest this week, so um, well for the the next upcoming episode that will be published. Um, so I said, how do I pick which topic? And then I thought, hey, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to hop inside of the group, and uh, let's just. Let's do some live coaching. If there was one thing that could have ended my business 17 years ago, it would be because of the numbers. I hate accounting, taxes, W9s, W2s, W40s, spreadsheets, all of that stuff. And I hate it mostly because I'm honestly, I'm afraid of it. I'm just not great with numbers. If this sounds familiar, or if you're so new in your business that it's not even on your radar yet, you need Core Group. Core Group can help you create financial systems and tax strategies that you need so you can grow profitably. And they've been doing this for over 20 years. They become an extension of your team so that you can stay in your lane of expertise and then lean on them to help guide you along the way. For me, having a team of experts in my corner to help keep track of our books and a just to make sure that we're budgeting for taxes appropriately, to have an actual strategy for our taxes and our accounting is priceless. And it allows me to sleep easier at night knowing that I don't have to be an expert in that arena. If you wanna avoid surprises in your video business and you want experienced help building a plan for the future that you want, both professionally and personally, head over to studiosherpas.com slash core for more information. And when you're ready to set up a free consult with them, make sure to mention Studio Sherpas for a special discount too. Got your back. Get more out of your accountant. Go to studiosherpas.com slash core. Hi, thanks for being here. Uh, I'm curious if uh, if you do have something that you want me to talk about. Um, you know, when people enter this group, one of the questions is like, what what's stopping you from growing, uh, from growing your video business? So as you're here right now, um, a lot has happened. A lot has happened over the past few months. I shared um, this, uh, what was it? July 15th, I posted and I had asked uh, inside of this group, I said, what's your win of the week? Uh, Don't be shy. Let's brag and celebrate each other. Um, I just want to highlight some of these um, just because I thought it was so stinking awesome. Uh, Jeff Ham said that he finished his seventh feature film uh, since November of 2019. Wow, that's amazing. Um, Andrew said he's putting in some long hours, uh, to have a first look at a large training course with their largest client. preview with them went great. Uh, Joe said that he got a lease agreement in hand for his first office space, a 1200 square foot space in downtown Stewart, Florida. That is so cool. I remember my first office space. It was like the most nerve wracking thing ever. Cause I went from, the mortgage, you know, paying my house mortgage and having a little office there. And so wasn't paying anything extra for my office to like committing to a monthly amount outside of my mortgage that was very expensive. And I was just like, wow, this is, um, this is really scary. Uh, so congrats, Joe. Uh, what a fun step. And the, the, I think the great thing is when you take that step, uh, to, to, I mean, put yourself out there and and to try something that you've never done, to take a risk like that. Um, I had a business coach who actually owned the office that I had leased uh, forever ago. And he had told me, he's like, Ryan, you will, you, as, as, as the spaces that you enter, um, as you enter them, you, your territory will expand. And I, I wasn't really, I was like, okay, like you're totally like Yoda. Uh, I don't, totally get it. But in that huge office building that he had, we started in this really small building or this really small suite. And then I hired, I had one employee and then we hired another one and then we outgrew that space. And then he had a bigger space in that building and we went into that space. And, uh, and then eventually we took over another, uh, we added on to that space with a little mini studio and 
until eventually we had to move into a 2,500 square foot space and then eventually into an almost 6,000 square foot space. And he just encouraged me. He's like, as you're growing your business, it, it's not about like, you know, being bigger and having like, you know, 10,000 square foot space or like, you know, that's, that's not the goal. That's not my hope. That's, that's not what I'm going after. But as I put things in place to build my business and to grow, uh, it started to make sense in, in some, you know, real deep, maybe spiritual, uh, way that like, um, I mean, there's no guarantees in what we do. And we, I think we all are pretty aware of that case in point, what's happened over the past, you know, 18, 20 months. But at the same time, um, had I not taken that, that first step, uh, to get a studio space, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. And, um, and I wouldn't know, you know, I think there would be a lot of regrets if, if I stayed in, in the house that we were in and I could only grow so big being in that house. Um, so anyway, tangent, um, Really cool. Pumped for you, Joe. Uh, a couple more of these I want to read off. Uh, Kevin signed his first year-long retainer with a local college to do a series of videos for them. Christopher Amon finally released a behind-the-scenes video for Camelback. That's pretty cool. I've got a Camelback backpack. Is that how you say that? Uh, Virginia, she had a big meeting with PBS today. Um, if plans go well, I'll be start editing I'll be editing interviews uh, for my documentary. Colin, after dealing with really rough 2020, I just wrapped up shooting my biggest budget project so far. Maxwell signed a national brand uh, and a new university recently. Jeff, uh, last night his team covered a gig for him while he was out of state on vacation. That's what I'm talking about. Michael says he bought his first work vehicle. That is so cool. Uh, John Morgan, after three months of pounding on the door, dozens of emails, phone calls, and going through six people to get to the right person, I finally landed a call with Auburn Football today to talk about helping them with some content, and it went really well. Auburn Football is a big deal. That's a big team. Charlie closed a $4,200 uh, video high-end home build with a high-end home builder magazine. That is awesome. And Ben is adding marketing event photography uh, or he added marketing event photography during COVID-19, upgraded his Canon 60D to an R5, and had two successful paid photo shoots this week. Kapow, he says. Uh, so as I was reading over these last week, I got emotional. It was so cool because for so long, uh, you know, I've, I, had, I had asked the question for months and months and months uh, and just wondered, am I going to have a video business this year? You know, uh, so being in, in the beginning stages of the pandemic and being at home and just wondering what the heck is a year from now going to look like. So to reflect and, you know, I've had so many guests come on over the past year and, and people have been at, in all stages of their business, like really struggling. It's been really hard uh, to some people. They had their best year last year because of what they were offering and how they were able to offer it in a safe way that didn't really impact whether they had to stay at home or not. Reading through these uh, wins and these successes, people getting office space or booking jobs that are thousands of dollars or working with, uh, potentially working with uh, a massive university in their sports program, um, life is happening. And I, I teared up reading these. I was so, I was just filled with so much gratitude to hear the stories uh, of encouragement, uh, to see the wins, to hear the wins. Um, and for each individual, like those wins were big wins. Uh, you or I might look at some of them and be like, wow, like I'm not sure I'd ever be able to be there or wow, that's it. Um, but here's the thing, like for each of us on our own journey, like something, something that might be small to you or I could make the world of difference for somebody else and uh, could be that thing that they need to, to really go to the next level. So to finally, finally feel like things are alive, <laughs> it's probably uh, the best way that I can describe it, uh, is pretty overwhelming. And so um, I love this community. I love the fact that uh, we can share wins with each other and honestly, you know, I, I kind of built this community because I, I love people connecting with each other. Um, selfishly, I get a lot out of it. And, and this post in particular uh, has stood out to be one of my favorite because I think 
for me, uh, it just means that uh, we're, we're getting past uh, one of the hardest times in our history. And, uh, and I don't say that lightly. You know, I know that there, there, there still is struggle in, in all of this. And there's, uh, you know, pieces that we still need to pick up and things that we still need to do. And, and we still need to be smart in the way that we're trying to grow our, our business. And so I know that, you know, it's not like rainbows and unicorns, uh, but uh, there's hope and there's light uh, ahead for us. And, um, and we're just seeing the beginning of that. Uh, so that's really exciting. Okay, <clears throat> I'm gonna take a sip here and see what kind of things people want to talk about today. <laughs> I had no agenda. I should have come up with some notes to say, hey, if nobody has any big questions, then uh, I'll just ramble about this or that. Um, yeah, so uh, here I am on the page. Again, if you're just joining, this episode, well, what I hope to turn into an episode, uh, will be even better if you sh share some questions. Uh, let's pretend like um, let's pretend like I'm your coach for today. You're going to get some free coaching. Um, if you're struggling, if you're stuck, um, what is the problem that you're waking up with this morning when you woke up or when you sat at your computer or when you picked up your camera, what was the thing that was like, oh man, like I've, I've got this and I, I'm not sure I can, how do I do this? Uh, where do I go from here? Um, I want to, I want to talk about that stuff. Uh, that's w one of my favorite things is, uh, when I do one-on-one -on -one coaching, um, I don't have an agenda in those coaching sessions. Uh, I'm sitting across from somebody, usually virtually, and uh, and just say, "How can I best serve you today?" And what that means is like, okay, well, what what is the biggest thing? And sometimes people like throw up a whole bunch of stuff, like, "Well, here's where my business is at, and this is where where I'm trying to go." And it's like, okay, well, what's what what's your struggle? What's your frustration? Um, what's and then what's your what's the biggest? Like if out of all five of those things that you just said, like what's the one that if you could start overcoming that or if you could overcome that, uh, man, you would just feel a huge sense of relief. So that's what that's what I want. Uh, that's what I want right now today to be about. Um, so here they come. They're come. They're flooding in now. Um, and then feel free to, uh, you know, encourage people, uh, along the way here. So this is, this doesn't have to be a one dimensional conversation. Uh, again, the, the beauty in this group is that there's so many people in here from all walks of this business who've been doing it for a long time, short time, and we can all learn from each other. So don't feel like you need to hold back and be like, Oh, Ryan's, Ryan's got the, he's got the only answer. Ugh, I've got one perspective. That's all I've got. Okay. So Jeff Ham. Uh, hopefully I'm saying that right. Is it Ham? Ham. Um, he asks this question. He says, he says, where do you find most of your prospects? And the follow-up question is, how often do you play the Facebook ad game? It is like a game, isn't it? It's like weird. Uh, if you've ever done Facebook ads, <laughs> it's just like, okay, we're going to create this thing. Uh, this, And it's like a puzzle. Because you're not sure, like, are people, is is that image going to be interesting enough? Or is my tagline going to be interesting enough? Or is the call to action going to be interesting enough to get people to watch, read, click, take the next step? I think that's why I like it, because I like puzzles. I like trying to figure stuff out. And I don't look at the data enough. But when I do, it's like, I'm like, oh, that's so interesting. Okay, so I should never do that ad again. <laughs> I just wasted hundreds of dollars. Um so to be fair, Jeff, I, last month, I think we spent $25,000 on Facebook ads. Now where that comes from is we have a, uh, our course creator partner, Susan had a massive launch. Um, so she makes these hair, fl hair flowers. Um, th th no, way more than that. Wearable, floral, things. Uh, she used to be in the, the event space and does incredible work with flowers. And she is, she teaches all over the world. Anyway, we, we have filmed multiple courses, uh, of her teaching, you know, how to, um, how to make these flowers into awesome things for weddings and events and that sort of stuff. So she had this massive launch, uh, that required us to do a lot of Facebook ads. We've helped her build her email list from zero to 26,000. Uh, 
she's sold over the past four years a little over a million dollars in these tutorials, which is insane. Uh, and we're a partner with her, so we have a revenue share on this stuff, which is really cool. And this launch that we did last month, um, we filmed most of the ads that we did. We, we, we had testimonials that people sent in, so they were just real raw, authentic, you know, shot with their iPhone um, testimonial type videos. But we shot a couple of very specific videos like promo commercial, like a 30 second promo uh, that highlighted why people should enroll in this new course that she has. And uh, we sold over six figures of this course, which is a pretty good return on the uh, the ad spend. Although I, I was really hoping that we were going to do like two or three times as much as we did. Anyway, uh, with her business having someplace very clear, a, a clear path for her students, um, Facebook ads make sense for her. I, I've had a, a struggle justifying uh, doing ads for our video company because for the longest time, when we did weddings, if we would have had a pretty, you know, 15 or 30 second um, promo piece that just had like gorgeous brides and grooms and like, you know, gorgeous locations and whatever. Um, and then the call to action was like, you know, download our free guide on how to have a beautiful wedding video or um, even even set up an appointment if you if you're you know whatever that would have been very clear very easy we would have known who our demographic was we would have known how to target the ads correctly and um, you know even knowing like find people that are subscribed to the not magazine or that like the not magazine page on Facebook or that like style me pretty or, you know, just like wedding stuff. So really easy to narrow down that market. The problem with like corporate commercial videography is that it's such a massive landscape of everything. It's like all businesses, right? <laughs> Which is like, and they all need something so different. Some people need explainer videos. Some people just need drone coverage. Other people need a brand story. Other people need stuff for social media. Uh, other people need event coverage. So to to create a video, we, because we didn't really have like a, hey, let's go after um, this one market. To put an ad on Facebook saying, hey, tell studios, uh, need videography for your business? It's such a generic ad. It's such a generic thing that uh, is a waste of money. We, and we, we had tried a couple of different things, a couple of different approaches uh, to promote our videography services on Facebook, and it didn't work. As we're narrowing down our niche and getting more and more specific with who we are trying to target, Facebook ads are beginning to make more sense to us. We're not at the place right now where we're doing Facebook ads for our videography company. But uh, if you've gone through the five-day challenge uh, that we've, we've hosted, one of the things in there, we talk about having a lead magnet. And your lead magnet is something free, something of value for your niche. Very specific. So when we were in the wedding world, we had a document that was called, it was like, I, I don't remember, like top 10 tips to make your wedding video awesome or something like that for brides and grooms. And it was a down, it was a PDF. Like that thing would have been perfect to create as a lead magnet, to collect people's email addresses, to trade them, to give them a PDF for their email address. And so in doing that, you know, we could really measure the effectiveness of the ad to see how many people are signing up to this free thing. And then eventually we're pitching them our services. Like, hey, you're getting married. Like, you know, we'd love to do your wedding. So here's what it could look like to work with us. And we would just take them through a funnel and explain how we could help them. Very measurable, very niche, very specific to who we're going after. And because for so long, we've we've just like, hey, we're a company that does brand stories. So we kind of work with any industry. If you have a story of why you guys started, what you're passionate about, the, the soul of your company, then we want to tell that story. Really hard. We, we have not figured out how to do... Uh, a Facebook ad well, although I, I, I shouldn't even say a Facebook ad well, but but a, a lead magnet that is perfect for that audience because again, it's it is pretty broad. And that's just been our, that's been our own personal struggle. As we kind of shift and uh, 
are wanting to pursue more work with course creators, people that are doing stuff like Susan, people that are teaching online and that want to sell that thing that they're, they're doing online, that's a really easy uh, strategy for us. And we can think through like, oh, we, we know a, a PDF, you know, some kind of a lead magnet or a mini video series that we could get people to sign up for this. That totally makes sense. We can make that, we can get people on board and then we know what to sell them. We know, Hey, we can do your production. If you want to go deeper, we can even do a revenue share. We can do a partnership. But as the brand storytelling company, you know, we can make a, a really cool brand video for you. We just never fell in love with any of the ideas that we had um, lead magnet wise. And then to put Facebook for us, we, we just said, hey, if we don't have a really solid lead magnet, something of value that we're going to give to people there, it does not make sense at all to send people from Facebook to our website to our generic website where it's just kind of like check out our video work and hopefully you hire us that doesn't work it doesn't work for us maybe for other people it does um again if you if you're if your niche is very clear then you you you're in a much better place but if it's more general business for us we've just said it doesn't it doesn't make sense for us so the first part of your question, where do you find most of your prospects? Most of the jobs that we get are, they come from referrals, right? Which is like, what if, what if I'm just starting out? That's not helpful. Um, but having done this work for so long, it's like every year compounds on itself, right? Because we're meeting more people, we're being referred by more people. And so it's just like, you know what compounding is? It's just like uh, exponential, right? Man, I'm using all these really big words today. Um, but the longer you're in business and the longer that you're serving people well, the, the, the bigger your business can become and the more opportunities that you'll get. So referrals have been huge. Um, networking, trying to meet people, going to our past clients and just at, telling them, hey, we love working with you. Are there any companies that are not, not similar to yours in the, in the, like what you do, but are there companies that you guys work with that have a similar vibe, you know, your similar core values, somebody that we would enjoy working with as much as we like working with you. When you position that to a past client or a cur current client versus like, Hey, is there anybody you can refer to us again? That's general. That's like, Oh, anybody? Sure. I guess. I don't, I don't know. When you can talk about a specific pain point, to a, to a current past client and say, Hey, we're looking to do more of these kinds of videos for companies that, you know, need more leads or uh, need better training for their staff. Do you know anybody that not, not just anybody, but anybody that's like you, like, who do you like that you work with, that you partner with, you know, is it a, a, a whoever does your web design or maybe your social media or, uh, you know, another vendor that you work with? Is there somebody that would make sense for you to introduce us to? And if you would, could you make an email introduction? That is super non sleazy, especially if you're you're if you're approaching somebody who you're already in relationship with, like they understand you, they probably like you, and so when you're totally honest and like, hey, we're just I'm <laughs> I'm trying to find new business and not just any business. If I can be picky, I want to work with more people like you. Okay, that's flattering, and you're not just blowing smoke. Like that's true, right? So I would suggest those, those should be some of the very first things that you do. In addition to that, um, if you have somebody that's doing prospecting, if that's you doing prospecting, going out on LinkedIn, LinkedIn has been such a amazing tool for us to broaden our network and have conversations with people that don't answer their email, but they'll answer a direct message on LinkedIn. Um, I think that's a great place for prospecting. I also think that getting a virtual assistant or somebody to do that prospecting for you and finding somebody that's like ready to have a phone call, I think that's a great use of your time as a business, business as a as a business owner. Because here's the thing, prospecting, selling, two totally different things in, in my mind. Prospecting is like trying to find somebody that might be interested in having a conversation. And selling is like, you know, being on, on a call or in a meeting with somebody who is interested and, you know, has the questions. I do much better. 
I, I'm, I'm actually pretty good at prospecting. I just don't like it. it. It takes a long time. You have to reach out to 10 people to find one that's interested in talking. Um, I would rather talk to the people that are already interested um, so that they don't feel like they're being sold to or anything like that. Like, that's just like, that's just my jam. So um, I, w- I would recommend looking more into what is your prospecting process look like and if you don't have one come up with one and then pass that off to somebody that is nice friendly and that doesn't mind the tedious work of reaching out to as many people that fit inside of your niche as they can find on LinkedIn or on the internet moving on Larry Lair Bear Larry Wyzicki he says I am torn man I'm sorry to hear this I'm I'm torn between trying to adapt to a very challenging client that pays pretty well but is very stressful and hard to work with versus scaling back what I do for them or just flat out walk away. Anybody else have this problem? Smash that like button. We could start there. Uh, Larry, you're not alone. And this this is like the ongoing struggle of being a business owner, being in sales. It's like the money's good but the stress that they create. So Larry, I want you just to think, do you have any clients that you really enjoy working with that when they call, you look forward to picking up the phone and answering? Or when they email, you look forward to opening up and seeing like, you know, I wonder what's what they're thinking. I wonder what they're saying. If you do, that's great. Then you're doing something right. Um, if you don't, then, uh, you know, and you have all crappy clients, then <laughs> maybe get out of the business or just be okay with it's going to suck. I know that's not great coaching advice, but I do ask, uh, and I should have probably said this earlier, uh, do I have your permission to say things in a challenging way as your coach? And I'll just assume yes, Larry, because you and I are boys. When you work with somebody that drains the life out of you, and that you, you get nervous about answering their call, uh, the sooner you can break up with that client, the more energy. I mean, just think if all of your clients, you looked forward to their call. You looked forward to working with them. Like, that's the dream. The dream is for us to choose our work. The dream is for us to choose our clients. And the longer we spend time, the more time that we spend with people that we don't really want to work with, that drain our energy and our, take our time, uh, it, it, it's, it's just not good. It's not healthy. And we only have so much time. And if you think about the time that you would get back, if you stopped working with that client, like, could you find, do they pay you that well that you wouldn't be able to find another client like them? that you actually liked or, or two clients that you liked working with that, you know, combined, they, they could at least, uh, cover whatever this, this company that you don't really like working with, um, is, is paying you. I think we forget a lot of times, and I've heard just story after story of people saying that they, you know, quote unquote, fired a client, or they actually, you know, they actually did fire the client or like, we're done. Like we can't work together. Um, the life and the excitement and the freshness and all of the things that come with that feeling of like, oh, I'm done working with, you know, the person who sucks the life out of me. That is not the kind of company that you would ask for a referral from because more than likely they're working with other people that are pretty terrible too. So uh, you don't want, you want to talk to and ask for referrals from people and clients that you really like working with because they bring you life and excitement and and they appreciate you and all of those things. But I've heard so many stories of people when they fire a, a client, their time gets freed up to be able to find somebody else or like some magical thing happens in the universe where a, a dream client comes along because they're not being bogged down by this. They don't have the capacity to take on more work because they're, they're serving a client that is needy that's never happy, that's, uh, you know, really frustrating to work with. So my advice is to, you know, if this is your only client, you're like, oh man, if I fired them, I don't, I don't know what I would do that. I I don't know if that's really great advice and advice that I would want to give, but what, what I do know that you have multiple clients, Larry, and, um, you specifically, 
So I want you to just to think about how much time, just from a time, not an energy like where you're just like, oh my gosh, don't think about that draining. Just think about how much time you invest in that client and working on their projects. And then, you know, is it a nightmare beyond just a, a particular project? Like, do they want like endless revisions? Like, what are the things that frustrate you? So think about the time that goes into those kinds of projects. And can you be more efficient on other projects? And if so, consider letting that client go saying like, and you don't even need to say like, Hey, we're, you know, you're fired or this is the last project we're going to work on, work with on. We we've had a client recently that is just, <sighs> I have a hard time even talking about them without just feeling like the life just got sucked. <laughs> um, he had asked, Hey, uh, I've got this other project, um, really quick turnaround. It's, it's really short, small, you know, easy project. I'm like, no, there's no such thing as a short, small, easy project with you, sir. It just doesn't exist. So your definition of what that means in mine is like so different. So instead of telling him, uh, I think in the past there's, there, there's a feeling of like, oh, well, just, you know, tell him that you're, you're busy or, 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 you know, make something up. So it, the way that I think through is like, okay, I can't take this project on. Like, I don't have the energy. I don't have the capacity, the desire. The money's good. He's got a lot of money. But uh, at the end of the day, it's actually not that good because of how needy he is. Uh, our hourly rate just kind of like tanks after working with this guy. So being honest with them in a way that's, you know, what was it, like half, half true? <laughs> I think is okay. I also think you can you can fire a client and just say like I just don't think this is working out for for you and I. Um, I'd be happy to refer somebody to you. And so that's basically what I was able to do. With this guy I said, "Hey, client, um, we don't have the capacity right now. Uh, we can't take we can't take this project on." And so when I say capacity, I'm not just saying like from an edit, like we could, we had the time during the week, but as far as like the capacity up here in our heads and here in our hearts, we don't have the capacity to, to, to work on other projects with you, sir. So, you know, approaching it like that is, is kind of an easy way to, you know, transition from this client to, and if we had taken that on, so much energy and time would have gone into this new project and, uh, I can't get that time back. So what it has allowed us to do is to be able to find other time. And even if you don't have a backup plan, like another client that's waiting to work with you, the time that you would be spending with this client and the extra time that you'd be spending with them, you should just use that for prospecting, for looking for new clients, new partnerships, reaching out to old clients or current clients that you like working with and asking them that question, or is there anybody that is like you that we would really like working with that, that you could introduce us to. So that's, that's what I would do there. When did you hire your first employee? What role were they looking at trying to figure out who that first hire needs to be? I hired my first like real employee. I, I mean, I, I hired my, Oh, it was you, Andrew. Hey, um, my, f when I first started, I started my business and I said, I don't want to just do this business by my own. I love collaboration and I love other people's input. I guess that's what collaboration means. Um, but I, I, and I'm a people person. I like people. Darn it. Um, office space reference. Anyway, working by myself is not something I wanted to do. So as soon as I could, I was, uh, I brought my friend Sean in who started shooting weddings with me. Um, and it was super fun. And, and then at some point he started editing projects for me. He had a full-time job. And so he was just looking for, to make some side income. And we had a great time shooting weddings together. So many fun memories. And it was as I, my business was getting started. So, um, yeah, lots of, lots of fun stuff there, but that was, it was nice to hire friends. I had hired a couple other people that were friends. Actually, my wife shot some weddings with me and we quickly found out that that was not a good fit for her and I to work together in that capacity. She just was like, you're not like really sweet to me. And I'm like, Oh, I know. I mean, we're like on a job. Like I need you to get that thing and set that thing up. So I'm going to tell you, go do that. Uh, I would never talk to her like that at home. <laughs> um, cause that's just not the way that I want to build my marriage. Um, <laughs> happy wife, happy life. Right. That's what I'm saying. So I, I decided real quick that she needed to not work with me so that she stayed happy. <clears throat> anyway, <laughs> I think she's in the other room painting right now. She could probably hear me. 
Um, when it comes to hiring, if I were to start my business all over in, in, I think every business needs something different. Every person, every entrepreneur needs something a little bit different. There are some entrepreneurs that are super organized and know the numbers and love all the details. And then there are other entrepreneurs that are just the, the visionary, the super creative type that just want to make something and don't want to get bogged down by all the details. So you've got a visionary and you've got the the integrator, the person who like gets the stuff done and in some businesses, that that is one person. Um, but for me, as I've ex gotten experience with somebody who is an integrator and somebody who who can get the things done, can that can whittle all of my hundred ideas down into the best one and say, okay, okay, here's the plan for us getting that one thing done. When I experienced that, I my business transformed. We we were able to let a couple of people go. We we streamlined so much of our processes. Um, I gained a lot more life out of the work that I was doing because I had stopped doing so many of the things that I didn't like doing, wasn't good at doing, was inefficient. Um, probably lost money, and I got to start doing more of what I loved. So when that happened, that was totally transformational for me. So if I were to start my business all over, that's the first hire that I would want. Sort of like, you know, an operations person or a business manager. Um, but, you know, if I was only hiring one person, I would probably also want that person to like manage our projects and keep things on time and reach out to clients to let them know when they're going to get their delivery deliverables and, and be in charge of that and come back to the team, me, and if there are other people shooting and editing and just saying, hey, guys, don't forget, you know, I need this edit by four o'clock today to send to the client. Having that person in my life uh, has been so great. And then having that person for my team has been transformational because before it was really on them to remember the details because I told them, I'm like, I'll do my best to like try to tell you when the stuff is done. But like, I, I need you guys to like do your best. But it was like a creative telling another creative <laughs> To, to be good at something that they're not good at and it, it, that just never worked super well. So that role, super important for me. And then the other one that is so incredibly important if you want to grow your business is getting an editor. I mean, as the business owner, to be in charge of editing and delivering projects like that, finishing projects for clients, so time consuming, so incredibly time consuming. And the problem is we care so much about our work that you know, you'll just edit a thing to death. That's just what we do. So I knew that it, the quicker I got out of that, um, the better off we would be as a, as a company, even though my edits were good and I was, you know, I continued to be, become a better editor. That's not how I wanted to grow the business. I knew that I needed to separate myself from that. So those are probably the two biggest time saving, uh, efficiency giving, uh, life giving for me and for the team. Um, and it, and it really like positioned us in a way that people were more confident working with us because they would ask me like, well, when's this going to be due or, you know, how much is this going to cost or what's the, you know, they, they just asked me all these hard questions and I could be like, that's a great question. Let me talk to my operations person and we'll get right back with you. That to somebody is like, oh, here's a guy who's acknowledging that, that that's not his job, that's not his strong suit or whatever, but he has somebody on his team who that is, and he's going to bring that person in. Uh, that instills confidence in in clients, and confidence I think breeds more work, deeper work, bigger paying job works. <laughs> so there's that. Is that helpful, Andrew? That's a great question. Um, next question here of. Uh, Let's see, how to nudge a prospect who's no longer responding to your proposal. Ooh, yeah. Uh, so first question is, do you have the 10K proposal kit? Because in that, I walk you through, here's how you need to be delivering your proposal. So I'm guessing that you are not following that because one of the final steps before you deliver your proposal is to set up a time with the client to go over the proposal 
So you would finish the proposal and maybe even before you finish it, you would just say, hey, I would love to hop on a call, you know, what time tomorrow or the next day works for you and your team. So I can send this over and we can walk through it together and answer all of your questions. So there's not this like back and forth emails, very inefficient. Uh, trust me, I've been in this work a long, long time. And the questions, the things that we're going to present to you might be confusing. And if we can hop on a five or 10 minute call just to walk through that stuff, what time works best and go over it like that. If that never happens, then uh, like if they're not interested in doing that, then I'm not going to put together a very detailed proposal. I'll put together possibly some rough numbers for them to look at. But if you know my process at all, you also know that I do a workshop. So if, if a client, a potential client calls us and says, hey, we want to do a video, how much does it cost? I kind of, you know, step way back and hopefully you've gone through the how to get a client's budget workshop. If you haven't, it's studiotrippers.com slash budget free workshop. Go watch this because in that conversation, my job is to figure out where is this person, how, how likely are they to buy anything? Um, if I can figure out what their budget is or their budget range, then I know that there's some somewhat more serious than like, oh, we're, we don't really know. We're just shopping around. Okay, well, I'm not going to spend a ton of time with you because your project could cost a thousand, it could cost a hundred thousand. So in that process, I figure out like, do they just need us and our cool cameras to show up and they're going to direct our shoot or do they need some handholding? Do they need our creative expertise and our directing to, to make a great video? And nine times out of 10, that's what people want and need. They just not, not really sure how to articulate that. So I articulate that for them and ask them to choose, well, which one sounds more like you? And they say, well, yeah, we, we want a creative partner. We want somebody that is going to help tell us because we don't do videos full time and you do. So if that's the case, then we do a paid workshop. We say, great. Instead of like giving you a quote on this whole project, I need you to come up with what your budget range is. When you know what your budget range is, then you pay us for a $2,500 workshop and we're going to walk you through our storytelling process, our video making process with the stakeholders of your project. And my job isn't to max out your budget. It's really to, to take this budget range that you've given us and talk through the ideas and the goals and what success is for you. And when we know all of that, then in this meeting, in this workshop, we'll talk through our process and your ideas and we can squash some of the ideas that might be, uh, you know, include three weeks filming in Montana when you only have a $10,000 budget. We can't film for three weeks in Montana. So we've got to kind of make this idea a little bit different and kind of guide you along the way. So when somebody does the workshop with us, 100% of the time, they hire us to do the production. They don't have to hire us to do, to do the production. They can take the blueprint that we create for them from this workshop and give it to any production company and may, if they maybe if they want to save money from a production standpoint they they trust us on the our expert our expertise on how to make the right kind of video with a smart strategy behind it so they trust us for that they'll pay us for that they're not going to ghost us on the proposal cuz they're invested financially <laughs> They've paid us. We will at that point. We'll give them the blueprint. They they have paid for the blueprint. Now, if they don't want to talk to us about the proposal in any more depth after that, then that's like whatever. We made a really good hourly rate just doing this workshop and delivering this blueprint for them. But like I said, we've never had anybody ghost us. So the problem comes when you do free work, when you do free workshops, when you do, you know, free pitching and all of that stuff, then it's kind of like, well, hopefully they, they get back to me. So my recommendation is if, if you're not doing a paid workshop where people are investing their time that where they really like you and they want to work with you, they want it to work out. Uh, if you're not doing that, then uh, set up a time with them before you do all of the work of creating a proposal, uh, set up a time with them. And if they're not interested in going over that, then just give them a really rough proposal and who cares if, uh, if they don't follow up with you. But when you spend, you know, all of that time working on a proposal, there's like this uh, um, feeling of like, man, I spent all this time. Like the least you could do is like email me back and say, we're not interested or it's like way too much or you're crazy or we're putting this project off for another six months. Like that's the least you can do. So before you spend all of that time, try to lock in a, Hey, uh, 
we would love to go over the proposal with you on this day and time, and then you can figure out where they're at and the, how serious do they want your uh, proposal. Uh, question, moving someone from subcontractor to employee. We recently did that. Uh, I'm not really sure what the, what the specific question is, like how did you do that? The way that we did that is um, we, we, right before the shutdown, the lockdown here in Michigan, we had hired a project manager and a filmmaker editor. And Governor Whitmer said, hey, don't go to work. You're stuck at home. Don't. And as soon as she said that, we went back to the, actually, it was like a week after she had said that. We were scratching our heads thinking like, what the heck? And we actually went back to both of those people and said, hey, we have to rescind those offers because we're not really sure what's going to happen with our business. So it was really sad. It was hard to do. Um, having an operations person, I didn't have to make that call. Uh, Tyler got the, the pleasure of making that call. So um, that's one of the nice, nice things about that position, um, doing things that I don't want to do. So a bunch of months go by and work finally starts picking up for us. And we reach back out to filmmaker editor Zach and say, hey, Zach, we'd love for you to come on a contracted um, amount of time. Uh, would you be willing to do that? He's like, oh my gosh, yes, all, all aboard, all aboard, on board, I'm on board. So then we started onboarding him. No. Um, so he started as a contractor. We had already, we had hired him as a contractor. This was a transition to like, hey, we want to, we want you to commit. And I think it was 40 hours a week. We said, hey, will you, you know, will you work 40 hours a week for us as a contractor? And he was all about it. And then eventually when we said, hey, this is sustainable, like we're, you know, we've got enough work, things are looking good. Uh, let's bring, let's offer him full-time work. And so we just asked him, hey, would you like to become a full-time employee? And he said, absolutely. So we made him an offer. We made him an offer. He couldn't refuse. Just kidding. Well, I'm not really kidding because he didn't refuse it. I guess he could have refused it. I digress. Um, I'm going to scroll through the questions here and see if you have, if, if you made it, made that more specific. Um, uh, I agree with that. I think we're, I think we start our own business for the purpose of a better quality life. If it's draining, probably best to move on. Find what you, find what one you love. Yes. I think that's way better said way more succinctly than me. <clears throat> Wait, who said that's why my wife doesn't work for me? Um, yeah. Isn't that funny? I mean, we're, we are a great team when it comes to like parenting and you know, all that stuff. But, uh, some things we shouldn't do together. <laughs> I will leave you all with this. My heart is full. I love this group. I love this community. Uh, I'm so thankful that you are a part of it. Uh, I hope this content is good and this is helpful for you. I hope that you are growing uh, your own network of other people in this industry that can help you, support you, encourage you, challenge you um, in the way that you're thinking. Um, I think that's just the best way to grow. I mean, honestly, as a person, as a business owner, um, it's, uh, that has been the best for me. So, of course, like in my, I can only speak from my experience. So I want that for you. Onward Summit is coming up October 3rd through the 6th. Uh, next week, you're going to... You're going to see, I know a lot of people are on the wait list. They, people have been waiting. Like, when are you, when are we, when can we snag our ticket? It's happening and it's happening next week. Not the conference, but opening the doors for you to be able to register and save your spot. Remember, seats are limited. We're going to be hanging out at our studio, Tell Studios here in uh Lake Orion, Michigan. I, I forgot where I was, where our studio is at. Um, for four days, um, there's going to be tons of networking, tons of laughing, um, bringing in some really awesome speakers that are going to motivate us. They're going to challenge us, encourage us, all of those things. Uh, it's going to be a great time of growing, of building, of rethinking how we should be positioning ourselves and our business and helping us really plan for the future. So, you can go to onwardsummit.com and sign up for the waitlist right now if you're listening to this in the live. But if you're listening to the produced episode, it's like 
it's no more wait list. Like get, get your tickets and, uh, it's going to be rocking and rolling. So, um, that's all I got. Uh, thank you guys for being here and let me know how I can serve you and support you in all that you're doing. And, uh, I'll talk to you all real soon. Okay. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> Take care. Bye now. <laughs> oh boy. How'd I turn this thing off? <laughs>